This is Hannah and Kaylin back again with Double Talk. I'm Hannah. And I'm Kaylin. It's one of the most elusive butterflies on the continent. Ryan Pfeiffer is a writer and field biologist whose most recent outdoor adventure came to a victorious headline-making conclusion this year after 21 years. More than two decades ago, in the early 2000s, Brian got a hunch. Though it had never been seen in his state, Brian believed that the tiny, exceedingly rare bog elfin butterfly, no more than the size of a penny, just might be lurking around the bogs of his home state of Vermont. So it began, a 21-year-long, binocular-peeping, net-swinging, water-sloshing mission that led to one unforgettable, surreal moment of discovery. We called Brian to chat about butterfly catching, his fascinating hunt for the elusive bog elfin butterfly, and the broader significance of its discovery in a new state. Listen in. I have to start by saying some of my all-time favorite childhood memories are Hannah and I used to have our dad take us to different places across town to search for butterflies. He'd sit in the car like <laughs> as we ran around with our nets. <laughs> How did you first find that fascination? With, and did it start with butterflies specifically or was it a different type of insect or how did that all start for you? I actually started with birds. Really? You know, I was a bird watcher from way back. And you know, I used to chase birds all over the Midwest where I grew up. And um, then, you know, I sort of, I got out of college. I, you know, I realized that that wasn't necessarily a way that I could make a living. And I, I actually have a degree in chemistry rather than biology. I practiced chemistry as an air pollution chemist for a while. And um, then I decided I didn't want to be a chemist anymore. And I dabbled in writing and journalism for a while. I was a newspaper reporter for uh, 15 years or so and an editor. And so I've reinvented myself many times. All the while I was chasing birds and chasing nature any chance I could get. And I don't know, maybe as you get a little older and you don't want to run out so early in the morning anymore, or your knees are getting weak, you know, butterflies were just sort of a logical next step because, you know, even though they don't sing, they've got the beauty and flight that birds have. Now, we first heard about you from your decades-long hunt for the elusive bog elfin butterfly. And, you know, it ended up being successful, which is amazing. But I'm, I'm curious as to what made you believe that you might be able to see one in Vermont, despite the fact that there hadn't been a sighting. We started in 2002 in Vermont doing a comprehensive look at butterfly distribution and abundance across the state. I mean, these are among the most familiar insects, and yet we still have lots to learn about them. So in 2002, we said, okay, we're just going to start looking at butterflies all around, all around Vermont, see what we've got. And um, there were some species that we knew were here, but there were others that were on our radar that had just, for whatever reason, had never been found by people who came before those of us who were doing this project. So in 2002, I said, okay, I have suspicion that bog elfin is here because we have bogs and bog elfins live in these remote wetlands um, that are bogs that tend to be dominated by the trees there are black spruce in these bogs. And bog elfins lay their eggs only on black spruce. They live only in the vicinity of black spruce and nowhere else. So we said, okay, we've got bogs. They look good. We should see bog elfins. So that's when I started looking. And that was, that was in May of 2002 and never found them, <laughs> you know? And there's, there's reasons for that, which we can get to if you want, but um, in pretty much every year, I mean, there may have been some years that I didn't look, like that first butterfly survey that we did, it lasted for five years. But I kept looking after that survey, after that project was over and never found them, you know, um, until this year, until May of 2023. So, um, like I say, I, I, I think I've joked that I would find bog elfin in Vermont or I would die trying, <laughs> you know? Butterfly hunting keeps you young, right? Yeah. <laughs> it does. Like, I'm like, I get to be like a 15 year old kid running around the state with a net, you know? 
Um, and for this particular butterfly bog elfin, it's no, it's no jaunt in the park. You know, it's not what you would consider. The search is not what you would consider to be your average outing with butterflies, which might be in your garden at the flowers or in some lovely meadow or in some park. Um, and I think that's the reason it took so long. It's a challenge to find bog elf. And it's one of the most elusive butterflies on the continent. Tell us about that moment that you found your first <laughs> bog elf and butterfly after years. Well, to set it up, you know, why did it take so long? I think there's, and this may be a longer answer than you want, but- No, no please, I'm ready, okay. I'm ready. There are three reasons really why it took so long. One is the butterfly itself. The other is the place that it lives. And the third is, is probably me, okay? The butterfly itself, know that a bog elfin is about the size of a penny. So when it has its, when it has its wings open, it's about the diet, a little bigger than a penny. Most of the time, however, almost invariably, in fact, I've never seen a bog elfin with its wings open like we often see butterflies. It sits with its wings folded, closed over its body. It's smaller than a penny when it does that. So it's small, it's mottly brown. Let's be honest, it's not the most beautiful butterfly in the world, right? Um, and it, so that's it. Plus, not only is it small and brown, it flies only for about a little more than two weeks in the year here. So like you can think of butterflies being around spring into summer, maybe into fall. Well, bog elephant is only on the wing as an adult butterfly flapping around in the bogs, usually from around mid-May to early June. And then it's done, right? The rest of the year, as you know, it lives as either an egg a caterpillar or a chrysalis. So there's a limited window yeah. for me to find this thing. Um, and not only that, it's just not abundant. It's never obvious and not abundant, even in the places where we know it is. So that's the butterfly. The second reason is the place that it lives, bogs. These are remote wetlands, you know, that usually you can't drive to them. You know, usually you park, there's no trails to them often here in Vermont. You bushwhack, you know, you get out your compass and you say, okay, I'm gonna walk through the woods, usually during the peak of biting insect season. So you're like on your way to the bog and you're carrying around your own cloud of black flies and mosquitoes, you know? Um, and usually, you know, like you're on your way to the bog and you just say to yourself, you know, I don't know, I might be getting too old for this shit, you know? <laughs> and um, you're in the woods and then you suddenly get to the bog. And bogs are, for me, places where I feel as if I belong, you know, like, I don't know, like you can, anyone who doesn't know a bog can think of a place where you get there and you sort of exhale and say to yourself, this just feels right. You know, it could be an art museum. It could be a, um, uh, it could be a baseball field, you know, your favorite team. Um, it could be seeing your grandkids. It could be anything. When I get to a bog, I just say, oh, I'm really glad I'm here because they're remote. They're wet, squishy places. Like you feel like you're walking around in soggy peat, you know, and that's the moss there. Sphagnum moss is dominant there. So you have the squishy mat. And depending on the time of year, they're like, purple orchids sprouting up all around you, you know, and there are other butterflies and other birds there. So the places are remote and there are not many of them and getting to them is sometimes difficult. So my choices were clear. I had to get to a bog to find a bog elfin, but the bogs I kept going to, they just weren't there. Um, or they were and I didn't see them, you know, and you get to the bog and even though you're getting attacked by clouds of mosquitoes, you just, everything to me at least seems right. And I just feel good there. Bog elfin or no bog elfin. And then the third, the third reason why it took so long was me, I, I think that, you know, when I first started doing this, I don't know, maybe it was a little too eager. I was certainly um, inexperienced. I don't think I had just figured out how to find this butterfly, how to sense the right places for it, how to be in the bog and be aware enough yet calm and alert enough 
just to pick up on this little tiny brown thing, right? That's descending from the tops of spruce boughs occasionally to grace you with its presence. Um, even though most of the time it is sending down its legions of mosquitoes to defend the bog from you, you know? Uh, so I think that I just needed time to yeah. figure out how to find this butterfly. You needed to become one with the bog alpha. In, in a sense, I think that's true, Kaylin. I think that, you know, you just, you just, I feel right in a bog. And finally, after, after a certain amount of time, I felt like I was, I was one with the bog and I could find this butterfly. Right before, did you feel like this is going to be it? I just imagine that meme where the yeah. guy is like drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling and he doesn't know that he's right at the, right. the where he's going to get a bunch of crystals. Right. And what if you turn around there yeah. and, and you're, you're right about to hit that, that landmine? Yeah. What I can say is that um, the, I, I got to into the habit of saying, I'm going to a bog to not find bog elephant. So I can't, I can't say that I was always optimistic or had the sense that this was right. Um, but I will say this, I got out of my, parked my truck, I was getting my gear together, insect net. I have a pair of boots that get wet. They're old hiking boots that just, I slosh around in, um, you know, my GPS, my navigating unit, my notebook my camera gear and my binoculars. I'm sort of pulling that gear together. And I look just past my truck where I parked it and a bobcat sauntered by. It just sort of walked past my truck. It never saw me. And then it disappeared into the bog. And I said, well, that's kind of cool. You know, like I'm going that way too. Uh, never saw the bobcat again. And so I felt good. And then I got into the bog and I said, I did say, I like this bog a lot. I like what I'm seeing. And what you see when you get into a bog in mid to late May in Vermont, there's a plant, it's like a, it's like a rhododendron. It's called Rhodora and um, it is a rhododendron. It's rhododendron canadense is the, is the plant. And it's a shrub with these outrageous fuchsia purple flowers that are just in, exploding into bloom before the leaves come out on the plant. And so you're, and then there were tall bush blueberries that were, I had these little dangling bell-like flowers, white flowers that were everywhere around me, you know? And so these are nectar sources for bog elfin. I'm just, I'm digging it. You know, I'm like having a great time anyway. And I will say that I did get to a spot where I really did say, wow, I just like this part of the bog. Sure enough, this little brown thing just sort of tumbles out of the canopy of the black spruce and lands on another black spruce that's stunted, small, many of them are like waist high. And um, the other thing to know is there is another little brown butterfly also flying that's very closely related to bog elfin. They're called brown elfins. And I'd already been seeing those. They're slightly bigger than a penny. You know, they're slightly bigger than a bog elfin. Bog elfin is really tiny butterflies. You know, this felt different as it landed on the top of it. It was smaller. And so I lifted my binoculars and it sat there and I said, this is a bog elfin, you know? And I, I'm not normally in the habit of talking to butterflies when I go into bogs, you know? But I did say, I've been looking for you. <laughs> but it was, I have to say, I didn't like, there was no fist pump. There was no yes. There was just <laughs> kind of a calm assurance, like a calm vindication, I guess. Then I reached for my camera to get incontrovertible evidence. I was alone. And I usually am when I'm looking for this butterfly. And just as I reached for my camera, the butterfly takes off. And so then I started chasing this thing around. I never saw it again. And I'm walking around. And usually with butterflies, even bog elephants, as rare as they are, if there's one, there's going to be another. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I saw one flying. So this one I netted. I swung my net and I caught it in my net and I put it in a little, you know, a little, a little vial like this, right? So it fit easily into this vial, this butterfly. I took iPhone pictures of it actually. And I had some pretty expensive camera gear with me and then let it go. And, you know, and then I was like, Okay, my, you know, in some ways, my work is done here. I finally found bog elephant in our state in Vermont, and it's not in many states or provinces. 
um, but I documented its presence here. And in a way, my work is done. And I could just kind of relax and enjoy myself in the bog. And I did encounter one other that I got a picture of with my good gear. On that day? On that same trip. Yeah. Wow. And um, and then went back, um, I believe, two days later and got some better photos of them. I will always go to bogs. I don't care about... I have, I have a... I kind of have an, a policy when I am on bogs. And that is... No matter how old I feel or how many mosquitoes are attacking me or how wet my feet are, there is no complaining on a bog, you know, ever. And, and I say on a bog because you are walking on this squishy, spongy, sometimes bouncing mat of vegetation. Bogs are good without bog elephants. They're, they're, they're better and they're more wonderful with bog elephants. Are there bigger implications for the fact that we now know that there are bog elfin in Vermont? That's a great question. You know, there are bigger implications. Vermont now joins just a very few states and adjoining provinces here in northern New England um, and Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia with the obligation to protect this butterfly because it's found nowhere else in the world. And that, you know, to protect an animal, no matter how obscure or prosaic, I think is kind of like a solemn responsibility. You know, like there are no other bog elephants uh, in any other regions of the world. And even though this is a little brown butterfly that most people will never see, I think that the idea of a bog elephant is something that people can relate to. That we know this animal is here now in Vermont. Luckily, this bog is already protected. Um, and, um, but we need now, we now have a new responsibility to protect this little butterfly. And it, in some ways, I think it might even go beyond the butterfly itself. In a lot of ways, it's about us. It's like, what's our moral responsibility? Like we have, we know we, we protect the charismatic animals everywhere, but the obscure and uncharismatic, you know, sometimes that takes a little bit of extra, I don't know, determination and uh, commitment. You said something that really stood out to me and I want to just address it head on. Because <laughs> there are people in the world who say, who cares if a certain species of butterfly becomes extinct? What yeah. would you say to those people? I recognize that people don't always relate in the same way, but I think people relate in many ways to similar sacred ideas. Paris without the Eiffel Tower would still be a great city, but it's a better city with the Eiffel Tower in it, you know, and bogs are still bogs for many of us. But a bog with a bog elephant is a better bog. I think that protecting endangered species or vulnerable species really is no different. You know, that you protect life in many ways, whether it's purple and glittery, like a really wonderful blue, you know, morpho butterfly, or whether it's a little brown butterfly in a bog. You know, I think we're, 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 we're protecting an idea as well. And it's, I think it's a moral question for us. I had never heard specifically of the bog elfin, but hearing you talk about it, it makes it seem like the most special butterfly in the world. Well, also, the story that you have about finding it and the, what we know about it now, like it makes it, that is, I think that's what's special about the story is it's like, you just have to learn about the, the story of, even if it's just a small little brown butterfly, like look at this big story that we have now. You know? Yeah, I'm just curious because it's so rare. Do you have like a general estimate of how many bog elfins are in the world? The number of bogs where we know bog elfins exist is probably, I don't know, 20s or 30s or 40s. Like there are, pro there are fewer than 100 places in the world where bog elfin, we know that bog elfins exist. Now, you know, there are lots of bogs that people never go to, you know? So we, d we can't say for sure. The insects are by their nature, 
exceedingly abundant, you know, like we're talking about millions or billions of insects, you know, of, 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 of a given common species. So yeah, this one's rare and it's rare because butterflies just a little bit where you probably know this already, there are generalists and specialists. Generalists, generally the caterpillars will eat many different plants. And this is generally the case with moths as well, you know? So you can have a butterfly that has broad distribution, a lot of individuals out there because they're just doing okay. And then they're specialists and bog elfin is nothing if not a specialist. It only lives on black spruce. The caterpillars actually eat the needles of black spruce. That is a evergreen tree, like a Christmas tree, right? A coniferous tree. And it will, the caterpillars of bog elfin will eat no other plant. The last thing I want to know is where to next, right? You've completed this mission of 21 years. Where does your focus turn now? Someday maybe we'll have another conversation about dragonflies because I spent a lot of time with them as well. Here's an insect that flies around, kills things, mostly other ins only other insects really, flies around, kills things, has crazy sex <laughs> on the wing and really has been around like dragonflies evolved, like they kind of showed up on earth about 300 million years ago, a little more than 300. They got it right a long time ago and they haven't really changed much, you know? They're really audacious insects.